All right. A uh, lot of familiar faces. <laughs> New faces. Must be. Let me start with the customary chant. <laughs> Om Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityurma Amritam Gamaya Om Shanti 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 Om Lead us from the unreal to the real Lead us from darkness unto light Lead us from death to immortality Om Peace Peace Namaste and good evening, everybody. So I must thank uh, FIU, the, the Hindu Students Organization, Kevin and his team for organizing this and having us here on the beautiful campus this evening. The subject that I have chosen is the way of knowledge, Vedanta, the way of knowledge. What I'll do is I'll dive right into this subject, give us an introduction, give us hopefully um, a practical taste of what is meant by the way of knowledge, and then um, open it up for discussions, for question and answer. I'll try to keep track of them. Thanks. All right, here goes. In spiritual life, we have different paradigms or different approaches. So in order to understand, appreciate what is the way of knowledge, it's important to distinguish it from um, conceptions of spiritual life which we all have. Um, so, for example, I'll broadly speak about three uh, main approaches to spiritual life. Uh, the first one is the most familiar. The reason I'm doing this is not that I, I'm going to say one is right or the others are wrong. Let me say at the outset, all of them are right. They all work. In fact, Sri Ramakrishna's great um, conclusion after his varied experiments in mystical life and spiritual life. In Bengali, he said, Jatomat Tatopat, as many uh, faiths, as many way, uh, faiths, uh, approaches, they're all ways to spiritual realization. As many faiths, so many paths. So they're all right. They're all wonderful. And uh, one, um, come on, come on in. Just uh, the seats all over the place. So there are different paths to spiritual uh, realization, spiritual life. Um, one of those paths is uh, most familiar to us. It's the God-centered path, the devotional path, you know, where we are, um, we are told that there is a God and who is typically the creator of this entire universe, and omniscient, omnipresent, all the omnis. And um, you have devotion to God, faith in God, surrender to God, and that is the way. And God will take it. The rest of it, you leave it to God. Our ultimate God, realization, enlightenment, moksha, nirvana, salvation, it all depends on the grace of God. And of course, our own love, devotion, prayer, surrender to God. So that's the devotional paradigm. Um, in Sanskrit, there's a work word for it, bhakti, love of God, devotion to God. That's one. But we are not concerned with that today. There is another way. See, each of these paradigms, they have their own uh, way of situating the problem and the solution. Each of them have their own um, merits, their own defects. Um, so in the bhakti paradigm, the idea is that the problem is, we see God exists. And the problem is we don't have faith, we don't have belief, we don't have love, devotion, surrender. And the solution is to have faith or love or surrender to God. Now, the problem in this approach is, of course, uh, one big problem would be skepticism. Um, in this day and age, you know, the great atheists of our time, Christopher Hitchens and uh, Sam Harris and uh, who else? Uh, Richard Dawkins and all. Sometimes when people are very emotional about religion, very sentimental, I say you go through a course, like an antibiotic course, 30 days listen to Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris, it will cure you of your religion. <laughs> um, that's the problem with this devotional path. The problem is, yeah, is atheism, is skepticism. And in today's world, somebody said, in this world of ours today, 
we have the largest number of non-believers in God, atheists or agnostics ever in human history. Especially with the adv advance of, um, of uh, humanism and science, it becomes difficult to defend some of the, um, um, you know, the dogma that is associated with this path. In this path, the thing is, in the path of devotion, it starts with faith and it proceeds with faith. At the very beginning, you can't say that I don't believe. I don't believe all this. If you stay, say that, this path will not start for you. It starts with belief and faith. And it, it depends on faith uh, to proceed. Why I'm saying proceed, at the end of it, it's no longer faith. It's actually a realization. And that's possible. As against this, there is another way, which is the way of, I would say, experience, of experience. Uh, mystical experience, extraordinary experience. In Sanskrit, you might call it the yogic way. Here, the paradigm is not that you have to believe in something. It really doesn't depend on faith. It is possible to experience that spiritual reality which is taught. So as Vivekananda, Swami Vivekananda put it, if God exists, I should be able to see God. If I have an immortal soul, I should be able to feel it. It should be uh, experiential. He said, religion is not believing in a book. Religion is realization. So this was a powerful message. Vivekananda brought it to the United States. In fact, the young student, Narendranath Dutta, most of us Indians we know, he becomes Vivekananda, Swami Vivekananda, because of this kind of approach to religion. He went around, if you remember, late 19th century Calcutta, asking religious teachers, have you seen God? Not that, is, does God exist? Or should I, why should I believe in God? No, have you seen God? Um, and of course, he found his teacher, Sri Ramakrishna, who gave a very direct answer. Yes, I have seen, and so can you. And Vivekananda would later say in this country, you know, in the late 19th century, when he came here, he would say that uh, if somebody says, I have seen, you cannot, and you must believe me, don't believe in such a person. But if somebody says, I have seen, and you can see too, you can believe in such a person. So this path, um, an example would be, a classic example would be Patanjali Yoga Sutras, where it's not a question of believing in something. You're very clearly told, this is how you practice. This is how you sit. This is how you breathe. This is how you withdraw your senses from the world outside. This is how you turn inwards and focus. And in that practice, ultimately, the fact that we are not the body, we are not the mind, with this luminous, um, ever-present consciousness, this becomes revealed to us. Yoga Chitta Vritti Nirodha. That's a sutra, Yoga Sutra. Um, yoga is cessation of the modifications of the mind. And then what happens if you can calm the mind down in deep meditation? The claim is that the next sutra says, Tadadrashtu Swarupi Avasthanam. At that time, the witness consciousness is appreciated, realized in its real nature. That as you are, you see that you are awareness itself. You are not a body with mind and awareness. You are awareness experiencing the mind and the body and the world. That's one approach. That's one approach. And um, Patanjali Yoga Sutras is one such um, you know, classic experiential approach to spiritual. But there are others also. There are Buddhist paths. There are tantric paths uh, to this experiential approach. Sri Ramakrishna was a super mystic, let's say, extraordinary experiences. You know, he had visions of God. For him, God was mother, was the divine feminine mother. Now, this also... Here, the paradigm is, the yogic path, the path of experience is, the paradigm is, the problem is the uh, restlessness of the mind. And if you can calm and focus and center the mind enough, the solution is meditation and, and centering the mind and quietening the mind, you will get enlightenment or realization. Again, the problem with this kind of an approach is, it can still be doubted. You know, mystics. Mystics of all ages, what, what's the first problem they face? Even someone like Sri Ramakrishna. The first thing people would say is, you're crazy. And it's natural because the mystic is seeing something, claiming an experience which the rest of us don't have. If you read the accounts of Sri Ramakrishna having a vision of Kali, when you notice also that the people who are watching this, they are not having that vision. They're amazed. This person is there. They, they feel a kind of vibration. They feel a kind of atmosphere in the room, upliftment. But clearly, they are not seeing God or Kali or anything like that. Now, this immediately leads to the charge of, if it's not a public experience, if it's not a shared experience, 
if I say, for example, if I say here we are all sitting in this room, pretty much everyone here would agree. But if I say here we are all sitting in this room and I am seeing God right here, he would say, hmm, are you sure, Swami, you are not high on something? <laughs> you, you, you say that. And uh, today people might not say you're crazy, but uh, a neuroscientist might come, come and say that um, we don't doubt that you are experiencing light or you're feeling one with the universe, but it's not that actually you're actually one with the universe. It's just that you have a stroke on this part of your brain and you're bleeding from that side and that's why you're feeling there was, in fact, one of the most popular TED Talks was this lady. She's a trained neuroscientist herself, and she had a stroke, and she had an epiphany, a spiritual experience of oneness with the universe. And she explains how, because of that uh, event in the brain, she got this kind of a feeling. Just because you get this feeling doesn't mean it's true. It could be just some neuro, uh, like neurological problem in the brain, some kind of pathology. So that this is a problem with the um the path of mystical experience extraordinary experience it can be doubted it can be doubted there are gen genuine mystical experiences that's the, the record of all the mystics of all the religions in the world that uh, there are genuine ways of experiencing the divine and those are extraordinary and very valuable mystical experiences there's no doubt about that but then how do you distinguish between what is genuine and what might be pathological what might be caused by um, uh, by these, uh, there are there's a whole new science of hallucinogens and all that. They, they give you all sorts of experiences. So that's the second approach, the path of uh, mystical experience. Now I'm saying all of this to build it up to what I'm going to talk about to distinguish carefully. So the third one, which I'm going to speak about today, also happens to be my favorite <laughs> uh, sort of subject, which I want to talk about is what is less known than these two other paths. It's less known. Um, the way of faith, devotion, love of God, most well known. Everybody's familiar. Whether you believe in it or not, most people who believe in God are on that path. Most people who are against God and against religion, they're attacking that path, the you know, path of belief. The second path, the path of mystical experience, has become more and more well known, especially in the United States since the whole New Age movement and everything. I sort of think uh, it became prominent. It was always there, but became prominent with the arrival of Vivekananda in the late, uh, late uh, 19th century. But also became very prominent uh, in our, in the in American culture about the 1960s, 70s onwards, the New Age movement. Now, I want to distinguish this from the other two approaches, and I want to show you some. I would like to argue for some special advantages. This third path. Has. What is this third path, and what are its advantages? The third way, the way of knowledge, it says, it says that we are already what we are seeking for. That um, immortality, that limitless existence consciousness place, which in Vedanta is called Satchit Ananda, existence consciousness place. Uh, we already are that. And so are you. Everybody is. And the real problem is we don't know it. Uh, we are under uh, ignorance and error. So we think, not only think, we are absolutely sure I am this body and mind. I am this little person. We don't even question it. Even when we come to spiritual life, I am this person, but I'm in search of something extraordinary, divine, spiritual, God, whatever. But me, I don't ever look back at myself. I see myself as an established fact. Vedanta, the way of knowledge, questions this and says that you are that which you are seeking for. The whole of the Vedantic teaching can be summarized in one short sentence. Uh, it's quite familiar. You are that. Tattvamasi. It's from the Upanishads, Chandogya Upanishad. So the claim here is, the problem is ignorance. And the problem is ignorance, the solution is knowledge. What was the problem in the first path, the path of devotion? The problem was lack of faith. And the solution is faith and devotion. What is the problem in the second path, in the path of experience, mystical experience? It was uh, your restlessness of the mind, and then the solution was to calm the mind and focus it in meditation, in samadhi, and then you get this experience. In this path, in the way of knowledge, the problem is said to be ignorance. It's not so much lack of faith, no, you're not supposed to take anything on faith. This is one great advantage. In this path, you don't start with faith. 
I mean, yeah, there's a kind of faith you start with. And that's the kind of faith which everybody has. Anybody who turns up to this classroom to listen to a professor speak about any subject, physics or mathematics, you turn up with some faith that this guy is going to talk about something real and substantial. You don't start by thinking the guy is a liar and the textbooks are fake news. Then you can't learn anything. But you have a working faith. There's something worthwhile here. That much is enough. In the way of knowledge, that much is enough. There's something worthwhile here. Let me pursue this and try to get it. The whole point, as we shall see this evening, is to try to get it. So it's not a question of believing in something. The second point is also subtle and not well understood. The path of knowledge in Sanskrit, jnana, and the path of meditative realization, yoga, there is a distinction. This distinction is not well understood. The distinction is this. In the path of yoga, we pursue certain extraordinary experiences which are not commonly available to us. But through uh, meditation, we achieve those states of mind and we experience that. And that's supposed to prove to us the claims that you are you're an immortal soul or God exists or whatever. Whereas the advantage, the uniqueness and the advantage of this path of knowledge, as we shall see as, we go, uh, as the evening goes on, we are not relying on any extraordinary experience. All you need on this path is the kind of experience everybody has all the time. For example, subject and object. You are the seer and you're seeing this world. You can experience your own body. You know, the subject, object, the mode of experience which everybody has. Or waking, dreaming, deep sea. Just this. Something that everybody has, a quotidian daily experience, that is enough to bring, begin the path of knowledge, the inquiry. So this is an advantage. Because if uh, the claim is you have to believe, it can be doubted. If the claim is that, see, um, you have to have this particular experience, well, until you have that experience, it still is a bit, bit of a question of belief. And also, even if you do have the experience, somebody else can doubt it also. Whereas in this path, we are not talking about anything extraordinary, we'll see. And every step of the way, there's no question of believing in something. It is entirely rational. It's a rational inquiry, a logical inquiry, a philosophical inquiry into what? Into our already available experience. What we already have. This is a great thing, an amazing thing. That's what makes it so uh, immediately appealing. So I talk with um, not only people from religion or mysticism, but also I talk with uh, cognitive scientists. I talk with philosophers of mind. These are people, if I went to them with talking about God in this form, they'll say, get out of here. We are not interested. But if I talk about mind and consciousness, they have to listen. Because that's exactly what they are trying, they are trying to study. So this is the path of knowledge. The claim here is that we already are this um, limitless awareness. You realize that's what is called the Atman or Brahman in, in Vedanta. And uh, it can be realized by inquiry. The, the method here, the method in the path of love or devotion is devotion, bhakti, worship. The method in the path of mystical experience is often meditation. Here, the peculiar method, the unique method is, a, is an inquiry. An inquiry into our own experience, the already available experience, and a logical inquiry. Okay, so this is the foundation. I have tried to distinguish the way of knowledge, jnana yoga, from the way of devotion and the way of um, mystical experience or yoga. Bhakti, yoga, jnana. I'm trying to make a distinction. Remember, however, this is just for the purpose of understanding. A spirit, an actual spiritual practitioner, many are here practitioners, you would not make so much of a big deal about it right? because you would go on practicing the elements of all in your spiritual life. I do. So do I. Uh, one of our great Swami, Swami Ramhananda said, when somebody pressed him for spiritual advice, what do I practice? He's, he's the simplest of advice. He said, try to keep your mind always on God. It's what I do. Do not make so much of a distinction between knowledge and devotion and yoga, and jnana and bhakti. 
try to keep your mind on on that reality practically that that's what most actual practitioners do so having said that that's a kind of uh, warning what we just did is a bit of an academic exercise separating for the sake of understanding however it's valuable now i still haven't started i'm going to start the way of knowledge you have set the sort of foundation and the background for this you notice it says vedanta the way of knowledge and uh, most of us we are aware of what vedanta is even if you're not it's just these texts um vedanta is these texts called upanishads these are the final spiritual philosophical teachings of the vedas the vedas are the um, the core the oldest foundational uh, religious texts of the hindus so in that you will find these upanishads these upanishads particularly are called the textual basis of vedanta literally in fact if you ask what is vedanta one answer yeah, but i was asked to give a talk on what is vedanta in st louis a couple of years back so i thought of it and gave seven answers but the first answer would be something that an academic might, might want to know what's the textual basis what are you talking about when you say vedanta well we are talking about the texts called the upanishads and these upanishads and of course in addition to that one text which would represent hinduism if we just wanted one text it would be the bhagavad gita that is also vedanta and there is also of course there is this text called the brahma sutras which is a uh, an analysis of the philosophical questions arising out of a study of the upanishads then these upanishads gita brahma sutras they have been commented upon and interpreted across the centuries in fact millennia by multiple masters in multiple ways and the schools of hinduism the various schools the flavors of hinduism if you will have emerged from these various interpretations come on here there's a chair here um the various schools of hinduism have philosophical schools have emerged from these interpretations of the upanishads um there is there are there are devotional schools like the vaishnava schools but there is also the advaita vedanta the non dual vedanta which today is what i'm going to talk about so what i did, just did was i narrowed down our focus when i say vedanta it means a whole range of philosophical schools in hinduism and in a broad sense vedanta is kind of the philosophy of hinduism let's say when you come go to different hindu sects temples uh, if you ask behind the bewildering variety of images and rituals what's going on philosophically behind it you'll probably find one or the other school of vedanta but we are here we're speaking about one particular school of vedanta so i'm narrowing it down further this is called advaita vedanta non dual vedanta why it's non dual we'll learn later in the course of this evening here the peculiar method here the, the message is that you are already that reality which you're looking for and if you realize that you are that it will solve all your problems all your problems at a deep existential level will it solve your financial problems may or may not but will it solve your deep existential quest um, you know fear uh, unhappiness misery lack of fulfillment will it solve that yes it will solve it. will it give you lasting deep fulfillment yes it will krishna says in the bhagavad gita having attained that after which nothing higher remains to be attained being established in which the greatest of sorrows cannot shake you so having attained that once you realize you are this atman brahman pure consciousness there's no, you feel there's nothing more to be attained in life one way to put is once you attain this enlightenment uh, it is said you have attained what has to be attained in human life you have done what has to be done in life and you have got what has to be uh, or you have known what has to be known in life having done what has to be done having got what has to be got uh, and what is uh, known what has to be known in human life imagine the fulfillment so this is our quest in the sense it's the final quest beyond the quest of uh, of art or knowledge or uh, Uh, of uh, social welfare of good causes in the in this world beyond all of that is this final quest of what are we what's the ultimate nature of things and what's our ultimate goal in fact let me just say here something very interesting according to advaita vedanta or upanishads also 
the nature of ultimate reality is called brahman the word brahman if you etymologically just means the vast the expansion without limit the vast now one way brahman is expressed in the upanishads is existence consciousness bliss so what is ultimate reality sat chit ananda which is translated as existence consciousness bliss and those of you who study philosophy you will immediately begin to note something uh, it struck me just it's a very simple thing but it struck me quite late only just in the last one or two years the fundamental question the biggest questions that we ask in philosophy what is real how do you know anything and what's the point of it all metaphysics what is real the study of what is real another new word for that a fancy new word for that is ontology the study of being and how do you know anything how do you know anything at all god exists the world is false or brahman whatever you call it how do you know epistemology the study of knowledge and what's the point of it all earlier there used to be multiple um, disciplines aesthetics uh, values ethics now they have all been clubbed uh, there is a new term axiology which means a study of values it could be aesthetic values moral values what's the point of it all now look at the definition of the ultimate or the, the way ultimate reality is conceived in vedanta existence what is real being itself is real being itself is real how do you know anything consciousness all knowledge is possible because of consciousness and what's the point of it what's the ultimate point of anything at all morality art fulfillment ananda limitless fulfillment uh, happiness bliss whatever you call it so i was just thinking the way the ultimate reality has been conceived of in vedanta it covers the entire range of the greatest questions which humanity has ever had what is real how do we know anything at all what's the point of it all anyway just an observation but not just an observation we're going to discover it today right now according to vedanta all of this this reality is present right now right here and it is you the the goal of vedanta the reality that vedanta talks about the way of knowledge talks about it's not something that is separate from us by distance you know one way to ask ask this question would be what is the spiritual journey in the way of knowledge what is it like well it's not a journey in space what i mean by that is sometimes you see the big board set up heaven is a place so if heaven is a place it means it's not this place it's that place so it's where you go to it's not here it's there the poet we read i think it was robert browning or gods in his heaven and all's right with the world very nice <laughs> poem so gods where in heaven not here there not here but vedanta says it's not a not a journey from here to there it's right here whatever we are seeking for is right here it's also not a journey in time not now and then another board i have seen on the way when you drive you see board board after death you will see god rather ominous big black board after big letters after death you will see god and below that call 180 zero something like that. but what what struck me was the word after 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 is a time word now and then not now afterwards after death so it's a time word when will you find that ultimate reality it, it's um, you have to wait in time you have to travel in time till then not now but vedanta says it's whatever is there surely you will find god in heaven surely you will find um, god after death surely but also here and now the ultimate reality is available to us here and now not only that more the dramatic and devastating is the vedantic claim what you're looking for is you it's not something other it's not an other it's not something apart from you so it's here and it's now and it is i now the question might be right here you might say that sounds cool very interesting but but the problem is if that's so why don't i experience it why don't i have it it's all very good to say it's here it's now here where i don't see it now when <laughs> and you're saying i but it's not me i'm whatever i am i'm not god so what vedanta is saying 
um, it immediately leads to this question. Show me. If you're making such a big claim, show me. If I have uh, like a devotional, faith-based approach to spirituality, I'm safe. You're, you're talking about, you might say, you're talking about God. Well, where is this God of yours? I can say, I'm, I'm safe. If I can say it's not here, it's in heaven. You have to go to heaven. Then I'm safe. Where is, when, when do I get, see this God of uh, yours? Uh, after death, you can't see now. Then I'm safe. Because after that, death, you can't catch me also, even if you don't see. But if I say it's here, it's now, in that case, you can legitimately challenge. Show me. What do you mean? What are you talking about? So here Vedanta says, since it is you, Vedanta says, we have to inquire into ourselves. What do you mean by inquiring into ourselves? Inquire into our experience of ourselves. What am I? Something that we don't do. We, we have to turn our um, attention inwards into our own experience. Uh, an, ex an examination of what's available already here. I'll just tell you two stories and that's it. And then we will um, get into question answers. The entire teaching will be in, that, in those two stories. First story is something that Sri Ramakrishna loved. It's the story of the washerman and his diamond. So the washerman, a traditional Indian washerman, uh, who takes the laundry to the side of the riverbed and then scrubs it dry and then you know, uh, folds it and returns it to you, uh, cleans it and returns it to you. The dhobi, the traditional Indian washerman. So this dhobi, he found a diamond. He didn't know it's a diamond. He thought it's a strange rock. And he used it to scrub dirty laundry. And then, uh, and, and then, no, before I go on, somebody has told me a recent story, a Philippine, Filipino fisherman. He had found a big, has anybody heard the story? You have heard the story? Found a big pearl. He didn't know what it was. And he kept it under his bed. And uh, he and the members of his family would always go and touch it before going out to the sea because they thought it would bring them good luck to catch fish. Finally, when they valued it, it was valued at more than $100 million. And uh, so they didn't know what it was. Similarly, this washerman didn't know what the diamond was and he used it to scrub laundry. It was useful, nice, nice rock, a little strange, but it's useful to scrub laundry. But he was curious. So he took it to his friend, the vegetable seller, and asked him, what do you think this is? The vegetable seller was a little more learned than the poor washerman said, this is a peculiar rock, it's fancy. I'll give you 10 rupees for it. How many cents? 0.125? You're a mathematician or, or, or an economist. <laughs> so, uh, 0.125 dollars, yes. Uh, luckily, he didn't sell it. He waited. And he went to, to ask different people. Finally, one day, he goes and asks the diamond merchant who says, this is the most magnificent stone diamond I have ever seen. I'll give you uh, 10 million rupees for it. And so he sold it, and uh, all his problems, his poverty, everything was at an end. He was happy. He, he had a, uh, all his problems were solved forever. Now, that's the story. Notice that the washerman always had the diamond. And what we are going to talk about, you will notice by the end of this um, discussion, you'll notice, yeah, we have it, actually. And the washerman was using it. But what was he, what was he using it for? He was using it for scrubbing dirty laundry. And we are using it, this diamond which we have, we are using it. What are we using it for? We're using it to see and hear and smell and taste and touch and think and, um, and enjoy and suffer and fight and, uh, you know, waking, dreaming, sleeping, all of this. I'm talking about consciousness or awareness. We're using it for that. We don't know its real potential, what it really is. And the washerman, when he finally found out, the diamond merchant introduced it, him to it, the real value of what he already has, and you have to cash it in. And then he, all his problems were solved. So this is the story. Vedanta says our real nature, which is already there. You don't have to, you cannot improve upon it. You don't have to add anything to it. You don't have to subtract anything from it. We just have to know it ourselves as we truly are. How do we do that? And that brings us to the second story. The second story, I'll tell you the story, then we will go through a process of a sample of this inquiry we have talked about, and then we will uh, take up questions. The second story is the famous uh, story of the 10th man. Um, 
it's a well known story and i'm going to use it the way one of the great post shankara non dual masters in india um vidyaranya swami who lived in the south of india in the area in karnataka and andhra today so the big kingdom the vijayanagar kingdom in the medieval india so he is a great master of uh, non dual vedanta and he uses this story in in his uh, famous text the uh, panchadashi in one chapter is entirely based on this story and he divides the entire spiritual life in the way of knowledge into seven stages based on this story and so the story goes like this 10 friends set out on a journey and uh, on the on their journey they cross a river after crossing the rivers one of them thinks have did we all cross or did somebody drown um and let's just count and one of them counts 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 oh my god 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 oh my god the 10th person is not there and the 10th person is drowned the other person comes let me count let me count and each of them counts and they find nine people the 10th person is not there they sit down and start crying and a person walks past them <laughs> yeah their story always is amusing the person walks past them uh, and says why are you crying my friends one of one of them says sir we were 10 friends and it's a tragedy the 10th man is drowned how do you know he must have counted and seen 10 how do you know how do you know epistemological question uh, so they say we counted oh show me so for first he says don't worry don't cry the 10th person is there so this is what we learn from teachers and books we we get this knowledge there is an ultimate reality there is an answer to this human condition how do we overcome suffering how do we attain fulfillment there is it's possible it's an indirect teaching it's uh, theoretical and they, these people uh, say all right but how where is this ten man is there i'll show you so show us show us well you count we did count sir you count again humor me one of them started counting if you say so 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 i told you and this man comes and grabs the counter's hand and turns it around and says thou art the 10th you are the 10th 10 this man goes oh 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 oh i found the 10th man and the other say let me try let me try they all try 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 oh we have found the 10th man we are so happy now this story um seven stages of spiritual life according to vidyaranya the first stage and this is uh, seven stages in the path of non duality in the path of knowledge in advaita vedanta this this will not work in the other other paths seven stages first stage is one of ignorance somehow the person doesn't know that i am the tenth man so ignorance starts with ignorance in sanskrit avidya ignorance and that ignorance leads to error error what's the error tenth man must have drowned because we crossed the river the tenth man must have drowned no evidence for this it all comes from the error that the tenth man is missing so i suppose the tenth man has drowned so error and uh, vidyaranya says exactly like that um all right let me give you the seven stages i'll work it back for uh, the path of non duality so the error is the tenth man is drowned and then from error comes sorrow affliction dukkha oh our friend is drowned how terrible what a tragedy and we are so unhappy then comes on the next stage when the teacher comes and says the 10th person is there don't worry this is called paroksha gyana or indirect knowledge what one might say theoretical knowledge okay i read it i heard it in a lecture i read it in the book i read it in our scriptures but i don't know it for myself so paroksha gyana technically it means indirect knowledge and then finally through the process of inquiry 1 2 3 for counting 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 ten direct knowledge oh i am the tenth the tenth man is here i am the tenth and therefore that that's called aparoksha jnana uh, direct knowledge technically if you translate it literally it means uh, non indirect knowledge so direct knowledge aparoksha jnana and then the sixth uh, stage is dukkha nivritti the sorrow goes away sorrow goes away and the seventh one simultaneously both of them come sixth and seventh is ananda prapti attainment of happiness so oh, we are so happy wonderful 
other step. We have got our dear friend, the 10th man back. Now this is exactly what happens to us in spiritual life, in, in this process of uh, the way of knowledge. First of all, we have the ignorance of our real nature. The claim is we don't know who we are. We are deeply, deeply mistaken about who we are. And then comes the error. The error is not knowing our nature as limitless awareness. We see the first thing that's presented to us is this body mind. And we make the error of thinking, I am this body mind. The mo and we don't think it's an error. We think it's a fact. I am this. Once I feel I am this, then my samsara starts for me. Here there are other people. These are mine. Those are not mine. These are my enemies and my friends. And these I'm indifferent to. These are the things that I need in this life. And all those needs come from my body mind nature. The moment I am a body, I am subject to hunger and thirst. I'm subject to need for shelter. I'm subject to fear of disease and old age and death. I am in the Vedanta Society of New York. I walk down Broadway. And what I see mostly, what, what Manhattan is famous for, is they say it's a foodies place. All right, food, food, food. And then clothes, fashion, fashion, fashion. And then entertainment, Broadway, theater. And you see, all of these are our, are our needs manifested in all these things. Nobody needs all that, that, all that much, much food. Nobody needs all those clothes. Nobody needs that much entertainment. But desires keep on multiplying based on this body identity. And none of that is particularly fulfilling. If it was, people would be fulfilled. You would go see blissed out. You do see blissed out people, but that's also temporary. That is chemically induced bliss. Now, so all of this, the problem, the struggle starts with this limited identity. I'm the subject to old age, subject to disease, subject to death. I, I, uh, I live this miserable life. Who was that American playwright who said most men live lives of quiet desperation? So we live these lives of quiet desperation. And according to Vedanta, in fact, all the Indian systems, Buddhism, Jainism, all schools of Hinduism, not just one life of quiet desperation, many, many lives of quiet desperation. We die and that's not the end. It's not even good news. We come back and repeat this again and again and again until we learn, until we develop spiritually and finally attain the liberating knowledge, which, by the way, already happens to be ourselves. It's just us, our real nature. That's the amazing thing. Um, all right. Come on in. You're just in time for the main event. <laughs> You can, you can come here. There's, there's some seats. Is there a seat? Raise your hand if you have a chair near you. Oh, there's one there. Right? Yeah. All right. So we're just about to start um, self inquiry. What are we going to do now? An actual experience of self inquiry. Don't expect to be enlightened at the end of it. If you're that, that uh, <laughs> quick, then there will be lots and lots of enlightened beings going around everywhere. But. Um, at least you get a taste of what's what we're talking about here. We'll basically do what that man did, the counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Instead of counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We will count our experience of ourselves. We will notice it and label it and then go deeper and deeper. Um, what are we going to do? Those who have studied Vedanta, you know it as Pancha Kosha Vichara, an investigation into the five sheets or five layers of the human personality. All of these are entirely available to us right now. Nothing new. Remember, it's not the mystical path where you have to have special mystical experiences. Whatever I'm going to talk about is available to each of us right now. All that you have to do is listen to what I'm saying, notice it in your own experience, and keep track. Go step by step. Let's walk uh, in this uh, journey together. Where is this journey going? We we'll start with ourselves, and I, I will point out deeper and deeper dimensions, deeper in the sense of uh, deeper in your experience, not physically deeper. If you go physically deeper into the body, you'll find more body. You'll find <laughs> organs and all the wet and gooey stuff inside um, all right, let's see. 
and then hopefully we'll discover this amazing thing Vedanta is talking about that you are the witness consciousness, your limitless awareness, all these things. Start with the body. When, so now what are we going to inquire? Ourselves. Why are we going to inquire into ourselves? Because the claim is we do not know a very important fact about ourselves and we can discover it through this process of inquiry. Now when you ask, who are you or what are you? We, our you know, first answer is instinctively, I am this. The body? Well, yes. All right, let's start with the body. Let's um, draw our attention to the body. I'm going to do this twice. First, lay out the approach and then actually quickly try to practice it ourselves. When we look at the body, we are invited to see that the body, you know, the body changes from birth to babyhood to childhood to teenage to youth, middle age, old age, and so on till death. The body changes tremendously so over a lifetime. So I always have the intuitive feeling I am the same one. I am the same self, same person. Common sense tells me I'm the same one who was that baby, who was that little boy, the young person, middle-aged person. I am the same one. Not only common sense, law tells me. You can't say that the baby was somebody else and I am somebody else by law. No, you're the same person by law. Memory tells me I'm the same person. Memory, by the way, memory is not the reason why we are the same person. Memory is a very weak thing. It just patches here and there. So I am the same person. Body has changed dramatically. The changing and the unchanging cannot be the same thing, literally. What kind of an argument is this? It's not a mathematical argument. It's not a proof. It's more like a legal argument. It's trying to get us to see something. A battery of arguments trying to convince us. So the changing and unchanging cannot be the same thing. I have an intuitive feeling. I am the unchanged self. The body has changed so much. Therefore, I and the body literally cannot be the same thing. I mean, if a little kid is running around and you catch hold of the kid, either, either the kid will stop or you'll be dragged along. Similarly, if something is changing and you say, I am that, then you are all changing continuously. You can't then claim, I am un unchanging. If you think you are unchanging, then you cannot be the changing thing. Another, another argument, a more powerful argument is... Uh, Subject and object, seer and seen. I am aware uh, of the body. I, I am the knower of the body. Just am the no as I am the knower of this table, the seer and the seen cannot be the same thing. The subject and the object cannot be the same thing. Literally, the eyes cannot see something un uh, unless they are at a distance from the eyes. Eyes cannot see themselves. Even if you see a picture of yourself or a reflection of yourself, it's a reflection. It's a picture. It's not the eyes seeing themselves directly. So the seer and the seen, the knower and the knower, known, the subject and the object are different. In philosophy, they call it the, um, that self-reflexivity. It's not allowed. A thing cannot operate on itself. A knife cannot cut itself, for example. Similarly, you, the body does not know itself. You know the body. If you know the body, then you are the knower of the body, the seer. In fact, all our senses operate on the body. I can see the body, I can touch the body. The tummy rumbles, I can hear the body, I can smell the body. The body is objectified by all our senses. Body is an object of which I am the knower. Then the knower and the known cannot be the same, therefore I am not the body. Another argument, a third argument, there are many. I can give you eight or nine arguments, but I'll give you only three. And we'll keep using these three. They're like a knife with which we'll cut. Third argument is, I am aware. Whatever I am, I am conscious. I am aware. And I am aware of the body. The body is not aware. There's a, a psychologist, Greg Good. He uses this technique. He says, look at your hand. Now notice. You have to notice your own experience. Notice in your own experience that, are you aware of the hand or is the hand aware of you? You will notice, I am aware of the hand. Right now. Take a look. I am aware of the hand. Do you feel that the hand is aware of you? Does it say, hello, Swami, long time no see? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. You might say, so? Do that to the other hand. Is anybody a philosophy student? Are you aware of G. E. Moore's refutation of idealism? Uh, he, was, he wrote this paper, uh, refute idealism. He says, this is how I refute idealism. Here is one hand. Here is another, and therefore idealism is refuted. <laughs> Thinking this, uh, this is like a, that kind of argument. See, these two hands, 
these are objects i am aware of them they are not aware of me and that's true by extension of the entire body i am aware of the body the body is not aware of sarvapi ananda i the conscious sentient being and i'm aware of the body the body is not aware of me i am conscious the body is not conscious i am aware the body is not aware this is an interesting uh, way of putting it it's a phenomenological way those who um, have studied philosophy or psychology you see this is a phenomenological way of arguing from your own experience you are aware of the body the body is not aware of you by your own experience and therefore the aware and the not aware the sentient and the insentient the conscious and the not conscious they cannot be literally the same thing therefore i'm not literally the body um, summing up three arguments changing unchanging cannot be the same thing therefore i the unchanging self whatever i am i cannot be the body um, subject and object knower and the known seer and the seen they cannot be the same thing i the experiencer of the body cannot be the experienced body aware and not aware sentient and insentient cannot be the same, same thing i am aware the body is not therefore i am not the body literally not the body the body is there i am somehow implicated in the body very closely connected with it but the self is not literally the body um those who want the sanskrit terms for these arguments uh, savikara and nirvikara first one second one is um, drashta and drishya third one is chit jada chit jada these are the three sanskrit terms sanskrit is very powerful when it comes to philosophy the lang- the words are so compact you can u- use half a phrase and express a tremendous amount of meaning all right so i say all right i don't mean i am the body i might say what i meant was i'm not the body but i'm here in this body i'm in, i'm an embodied conscious being i'm here in this body that's what i meant so you mean uh, you know vedanta goes step by step he says all right subtler than the body look inward you say you are in there yes i am in here subtler than the body close to the body but a little more subtle um vedanta will say you notice the prana the breath not literally the breath prana is the, all the physiological energies flowing through the body breath is just the tip of the iceberg but the breath is the most noticeable so notice the breath are you the breath are you the prana same arguments will apply apply the same arguments changing unchanging prana when you are breathing in you are the same person you are breathing out you are the same person prana is going in and out therefore you are not the prana changing and unchanging second argument observed and observer are you are you can you observe the prana you better say yes the entire mindfulness industry depends on that you are breathing out you are aware you are breathing in you are aware huh? so i am aware vedanta take that much of it you are aware of the in breath you are aware of the out breath therefore you are the knower of the breath you cannot be literally the breath then the third one conscious not conscious i am conscious of the breath the breath is not conscious of me when you breathe in the in breath doesn't say swami i'm coming into your lungs now joking but what it what i mean is when you notice the breath you notice that not only that i am the knower of the breath the breath is something known but i am conscious and the breath is not conscious it's, it's a biomechanical action pumping air in uh, in and out of the lungs therefore i am not the breath what's it what's going on here what are we trying to do what we are trying to do is turning inwardizing our attention we started um, world let it take care of itself but start with the body because that's where the confusion starts we say i am not the body then inwardize attention further in your experience something more subtle in breath and the out breath and say i am not that then look inward further inwards inwards in your own experience phenomenological what do you find thoughts ideas memories feelings this is called the mind the mind sanskrit manas or manomaya notice the mind keeps on changing mind keeps on changing of, of course it does the mind is the most changeable thing we have we have thousands of thoughts and emotions and ideas throughout the day and you are the same one you had a pleasant feeling you're the same one you were excited you're the same one now you feel bored you hopefully not but <laughs> you are the same one i am the same one who is the witness of the ever changing mind if i am the same one if i am unchanged then i cannot be the changing mind changing unchanging therefore i cannot be the mind 
go further. You are the observer of the thoughts. You are the seer of the thoughts and feelings. I am the witness of these thoughts coming and going. I am the witness of these feelings appearing and disappearing. The knower and the known cannot be the same thing. The seer and the seen cannot be the same thing. Therefore, this is very subtle because what we always identify ourselves with is the mind. Most people, most grown-up, educated, thinking people think of themselves as embodied mind. That's what we mean by a person, basically. But here we are making a distinction between yourself and the mind. Everything in the mind is observed. Therefore, it's an object. You are the knower of that object, experiencer of that object. You cannot literally be the mind. Further, here is something very interesting. Conscious, not conscious. Vedanta makes a startling claim. This is where Vedanta parts ways with uh, even the most modern philosophy of mind. The, in the modern philosophy of mind, the uh, mind and consciousness are taken to be more or less the same. In consciousness studies today, if you ask, what are you studying? You give examples. They will give examples like thinking, memory, pain, uh, all kinds of... But Vedanta will say, these are conscious experiences. They, this, you are combining consciousness and mind already here. Vedanta will make you make a distinction between mind and consciousness. What allows you to make the distinction between mind and consciousness? This fact that you can experience your own thoughts. You can experience your own feelings. Whatever you experience is an object. You are the subject. Whatever you experience is the known. You are the knower. Whatever you experience is the seen. We are the seer of these. Uh, what comes up. Therefore, notice that. I am conscious of the thoughts. The thoughts are not conscious of me. I mean, it's a very simple experiment. Think of a thought, A, B, C, D. I give this example, A, B, C, D, or one, two, three, four. Just think of a thought, one, two, three, four, right now. And notice that one, two, three, four, is it conscious of you? Or is it conscious of me? Or am I conscious of it? Straight away, we'll immediately say, I am conscious of it. One, two, three, four is just like mental chatter. I'm aware of it. And all thoughts and feelings are like that. They seem to be conscious because of your presence. Uh, you mix up consciousness and the thought. In Vedanta, it's called a vritti, movement of the mind, that is illumined by you, the consciousness. And that's why it seems to be conscious. It's like the moon being a luminous body. But it's not. It's borrowed light from the sun. So even the mind is not conscious. According to Vedanta, the mind is not conscious, technically. Though practically, it is conscious. Technically, it's not conscious because it borrows consciousness from me, the one who is aware of the mind. So I am not the mind. Go deeper into your own experience. Vedanta makes a dist distinction between mind and intellect. Buddhi, mind and intellect. The intellect is that which is processing all this. That intellect, which we are using now to understand all this, that intellect, am I that intellect? But that also changes. From not understanding to understanding, from understanding to a fuller understanding. Yeah. It also changes. It's also something that is known. Yeah. We feel, I'm trying to solve a mathematical problem, not getting it. Suddenly we get the eureka feeling. I got it. We, we feel the movement of the intellect. The intellect is also something that is an object. And you are the subject. It's something that is seen. You are the seer. The intellect is also something that is not conscious. You are conscious. We are aware of the movements of the intellect. Intellect by itself is not aware. This is where we talk about, uh, right now it's all very interesting because of uh, in philosophy there's something called the hard problem of consciousness. David Chalmers speaks about it. The irreducibility of consciousness to uh, the brain. Um, and also in the age of AI. Artificial intelligence, very interesting. Intelligence is what is called buddhi, uh, intellect. And this is right now we are distinguishing consciousness from intelligence. I am conscious of the intelligence, of the intelligence here. One question I often put to distinguish intelligence from consciousness. Notice that the new AI and whatever is going to come in the near future, whatever claims they make about it, none of them are saying that these machines or these uh, chat GPT and all, they're conscious, none of them are claiming. We are able to do everything that our that we are ca capable of doing. And what we earlier thought is only available to human beings. Now these machines are able to do. We thought earlier, yes, um, calculator can calculate. Computer can play chess. Good. But the things which only we can do, like creativity, 
we can write short stories we can compose music we can make art no longer no longer computers are already doing it i went to the museum at manhattan the museum of modern art and when you enter it there's a huge computer display and installation and wonderful display of art and you stand you get hypnotized when you go in there i stood there for a couple of minutes and you look what's written there it's an ai which has been fed the entire contents of the museum of modern art and it's been asked to generate this kind of art this genre of art and it's doing it on a continuous basis whatever all those artists over the period of nearly 100 years have done this computer minute to minute is generating and more and more and more and more and you might not you might say it's not art it's it's uh, trash but no if you see the effect on people it's hypnotic people watch i also stood and watch for some time so computer is doing all of that creativity intelligence memory decision making i look at a self driven car except one thing except one thing consciousness why not why not i asked this question throughout this challenge to co cognitive scientists and co ai people and inter computer experts why not because this decision making creativity these are complex things if you are able to model these very complex things consciousness by itself you think about it it's not complex it does only one thing it gives us first person experience is asked it anubhava direct experience it just generates experience the ability to have first person experience. that's all it does why can't you model it but no nobody can there's not even it's an intractable problem that if you ask ai people and there will be faculty here also if you ask them do you know how to do it most will say we have no idea where to begin all the other things we are modeling nicely but this is we don't know what it is actually so we are conscious of the intellect intellect is not conscious of us we are conscious of the ai the ai is not conscious of us even when it says i asked the ai can you see me it says yes how i'm watching using your computer to video to watch <laughs> didn't say that but it can uh, on in uh, but even then it's not experiencing you it's an algorithm working all right and beyond this vedanta says if you shut it all out suppose you um, you know no external world no experience of the body you're not seeing hearing smelling tasting anything you're not thinking you're not remembering not desiring not trying to understand shut it all down like deep sleep that blankness that also is something that you are aware of aware of in the sense it's an experience i always say the blankness of deep sleep anesthesia coma possibly uh, would be uh, it's not an absence of experience it's an experience of absence that's how vedanta feels therefore experience is continuous that which experiences all of them and yet is distinct from all of them is awareness itself consciousness itself the essence of our self what you or i truly am that is the atman all right so this is the entire teaching we are still within time all right only one thing remains now i am going to do what that passer by said to the person who was counting count again humor me we will count what's the connection now follow this carefully what's the connection of that counting story with what i just said till now it's this the 10th person was apart from all that the 10 person counted now we according to vedanta we are apart from everything that is body prana mind intellect even blanket all out the blankness also all those are apart like those nine person and that to which all of these are appearing is i that's the atman that's consciousness that's the real nature of consciousness experiential in our experience right now it's always there now let me ask you this crucial question two questions why did that person not find the 10th person why did why did he not find the 10th person what would be the fir your first pass at this yes he separated himself he didn't count himself he didn't count himself right that's good that's the first cl clear answer we have to count ourselves we have to turn our attention to ourselves not to those objects second more subtle question why did he not count himself 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 
Why didn't he do this? Where was he looking for the 10th person? Separate from himself, outside. And why was he looking for the 10th person outside? Crucial. You will see that how it applies to the self-inquiry. Why was he looking for the 10th person outside? Because uh, he had already found the nine people outside. He had a reasonable uh, expectation. I found nine out there. The 10th also must be out there. It's a great indictment of our modern consciousness studies. The reason why we are finding consciousness so intractable. This is a debate going on in the philosophies of philosophy of mind departments. I've attended seminars in NYU, which probably has one of the best philosophy of mind departments in the world. This is a debate which is going on. Our entire way of doing science is predicated on we are, what we are studying is an object. And that has worked so well till now, because then what we have been studying are objects. But when you're trying to study the subject itself and trying to make it an object, problems arise. Problems arise. Just look, consider the ridiculousness of it. Consciousness studies. What are you doing? We are trying to study consciousness in the octopus. Why? It was very uh, fascinating. Don't say what's wrong with that. You are a conscious being. I am a conscious being. You are a conscious being right now. Study the consciousness in, in yourself, but you can't. They will give you a very good answer why you can't. Because I am the subject. I can, how can I study myself? I need an object. Well, what you will find in the octopus is the octopus, its tentacles, its distributed brain. You will not find consciousness like that. But you yourself are conscious. But you are going to ignore that because you want an object. It's like that tenth person. Looking for the tenth person as an object. Never find it. Never find it. What are, what are we going to do then? Here's what you do. I will point out as we go, I'll point out the levels of our being. Physical level, notice it. Then remember the three arguments, changing, unchanging, um, seer and the scene. And I am conscious of it. It is not conscious. So I, the un I am distinct from it. Then we will look at the next one, which is prana, the breath, all going deeper. Then we look at the next one, mind and feeling, thoughts and feelings. We look at the next one, the intellect. Then look at the next one, shut everything down. And then turn from there. Remember, you are the tenth. Turn from the absolute blankness into the witness of that life. That you have to do yourself. Up to the last one, this is called Pancha Kosha Viveka, the five layers of the human personality. In Sanskrit, Annamaya, Pranamaya, Manomaya, Annamaya, the physical sheet, Pranamaya, the vital sheet, Manomaya, the mental sheet, Vijnanamaya, the intellect, and Anandamaya, the blankness, the bliss sheet, something like our deep sea. And we have to turn inwards from all of that to see which is observing those five. It's exactly like that tenth man. Most people stop there at the Anandamaya blankness. One person, I'll give you an example, um, who used to meditate deeply. He, um, he told me of his experiences in India. And the deepest possible meditation he had once, very profound, quiet stillness, which felt very profound to him. It's about like a very life-changing, nourishing spiritual experience. But that's it. It went away and did not come back again and just tried to replicate it. So he says, but what happened? And what's the point of it all? And then I said, that deep quietness was a wonderful experience for you. And you have a memory of it. Try to recreate it, see what it felt like to be absolutely still, absolutely serene, peaceful, yet completely awake. And from that turn inwards, that inwards turn, you are the tenth. That I can't do for you. Notice, even that deep silence, absolute blank, even not you're thinking about anything, that's also an experience. Anything that comes and goes is an experience. So the question arises, who or what is experiencing that? What is the witness of that absolute silence? Okay, enough. Now, we'll just do a quick trial, and then just experiential. Get a feel for it. When those few who become enlightened, congratulations. The rest of us have to keep trying. All right, and actual um, practice of Inquiry, self -inquiry. So when you're ready, sit uh, straight, relax, don't be rigid. Throughout this process, if you feel like fidgeting, coughing, if you can't resist it, no problem. Don't worry. Don't fight anything. 
something that you can always repeat again. When you are uh, ready, if you feel like it, you can gently close your eyes and keep listening to my voice. Become aware of the body, relax the body. Become aware of the body, the warmth, the pressure, feelings inside the body, the skin, temperature, pressure. General sense of the body. And let us recollect this body has changed so much from the babyhood days, from childhood, from teenage now middle age or old age and I feel intuitively the same the same me and this body cannot be the literally the same thing I am not the body body is changing I am unchanging also I notice that I'm aware of the body I, I can see the body I can touch and feel the body I can taste smell hear the body uh, the body is an object and that which knows the body experiences the body and the seer of the body. Seer and the seeing cannot be the same thing. Therefore, I'm not the body. Experiential. An object. It's a thing. It's not me. Very useful thing. Very intimate thing. Always with me. But it's not me. And then uh, I am aware. Consciousness is always on my side. not on Whatever I am, I'm conscious. The body is not conscious of me or anything else. The body is not aware of itself. I am aware of it. The body is not aware of anything else. I am aware of everything else. And the body is certainly not aware of me, whatever I am. I am aware of myself. So I have awareness on my side. The body is not aware. Not aware, an object ever changing. I am not the body. Breathe in, breathe out, deeply. This prana, which sustains this living body, which is always there, breathing in and breathing out. Breathing in, I am the same one. Breathing out, I am the same one. In breath and out breath, ever flowing. Prana, energy, weakness, health, sickness, hunger, thirst, these are all prana. In the ebb and flow of prana, I am the same. It keeps changing, I am the same. It is observed. I can observe the in-breath and out-breath. I am the observer, seer. It is seen. Therefore, I am not the prana. And I am conscious of it. The in-breath is not conscious, nor is the out-breath conscious. I am conscious. Conscious, not conscious. Observer and observed. Changing and unchanging. Therefore, I am not the prana. Breathing normally, relax. Let us look inwards into our own experience, phenomenologically. Thoughts floating by, mental chatter. Feelings, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. We are all changing. I am not changing. Therefore, I am not a feeling, not a thought. We come and go. I don't come and go. I am there when the thoughts come. Feelings come. I'm there when the thoughts are there, feelings are there. I'm there when the thoughts are gone, feelings are gone, new ones have come. Therefore, I am unchanging and these are changing. I am not thoughts and feelings. I am their observer. I can experience my thoughts. I experience, certainly, I experience my feelings. Therefore, they are objects. I am their experience as a subject. Subject and object are not same. Seer and seen are not same. Therefore, I am not thoughts and feelings. Finally, I am aware of these thoughts. Like A, B, C, D, a thought. I am aware of it. It is not aware of it. In fact, thoughts are not aware of other thoughts. Thoughts are not aware of the body. There are thoughts are not aware of the world. I am aware of all these thoughts. I am aware of the body. Thoughts are not aware of themselves. I am aware of them. I am aware, thoughts are not aware. I am conscious, thoughts by themselves are not conscious. They seem to be conscious because they borrow consciousness from me. They approximately to me, the conscious being. I am not thoughts, I am not the mind. Further, relax, breathing normally. These understandings I have, the intellect, 
which tells me i am this human being man or a woman this is my identity these are the things which i know the intellect same it changes it changes from non comprehension to understanding to confusion and further understanding i am the one who was confused i am the one who understands i am the same one i did not change i am aware of the intellect the seen i am the seer therefore i am not the intellect i am aware i am conscious the intellect is not conscious being unchanging seer of the intellect and conscious of the intellect the intellect being ever changing and the seen object not conscious i cannot be the intellect Relaxed, breathing normally. Now, visualize that the world is gone. I do not see anything, hear anything, smell, taste, touch anything. Like in deep sleep, I am not aware of my own body. Mind also shuts down. No thoughts, no feelings, no memories. I have no memory of my own existence. Who am I? No understanding, Vedanta, knowledge, philosophy, science, nothing. Just blank, deep sleep. That I am in deep sleep. I am sleeping. That also is gone. No sense of ego, self. In that absolute unknowing, deep, profound silence. who or what is experiencing that silence is it not the same one which experiences the intellect and the mind and the senses and the body and the world who am i when you come to the deep silence like deep sleep drop that also do not try to objectify the witness consciousness you can never do it this note because of it deep sleep is observed the intellect is observed the mind is observed all feelings emotions the breath is observed the body is experienced and the world is experienced i shining all of these five shine by my light all this is lit up sitting relaxed breathing normally ready and gently open your eyes down first Look down first, and then you can look up. Notice a few things. Even if we are not entirely enlightened, I am <laughs> with this consciousness. That's what we are trying to drive at. Notice one thing. You no know, it's always there this witness consciousness what we are trying to do in this exercise is to phenomenologically in our own experience isolate it from all other experiences just let it be by itself but it's, even if you don't isolate just in day to day you know experiencing walking talking enjoying suffering it's always there it's the washerman's diamond it's like this when we are seeing now uh, if i ask you are you there yes and you are seeing the world yes close your eyes are you seeing the world no but are you still there yeah i am there i just don't see but i am here you extend that that thought experiment suppose i don't see i don't hear smell taste touch are you still there yes go further 
suppose i don't um think i don't remember anything i i don't have any ideas i don't even have a sense of ego are you still there claim is yes you will still be there that unchanging awareness it's not a thought it's the illuminator of all thoughts it's effortless it doesn't have to be maintained by a lot of vedantic reasoning without the least bit of vedanta without the least bit of meditation you and i and everybody else is that all the time but we are like the washer mat using it to scrub clothes we are using it for our our life unsatisfactory life but it has the potential if you cash it in it will solve all your problems how will it solve it, all our problems the claim i will not i don't have time to go into that now but will be shown by vedanta that consciousness is immortal it cannot be born it does not die there in fact the modern discussions on the irreducibility of consciousness to the brain the brain will die with the death of the body the brain will die but the claim is that consciousness does not die because consciousness produced by brain that's a big question now can you reduce the consciousness to the brain is a big question i'll give you the vedantic claim very um, uh, very radical i'll give it to you in five negations and i'll stop what are we, what are we trying to do this consciousness which we are trying to discover our in its real nature what is it i will try to say in five negations then i will tell you the benefit of it and stuff what vedanta claim says consciousness is not number one five knows five uh, number one consciousness is not brain not not brain number two consciousness is not um uh, is not mind Very interesting consciousness is not a, not the mind which we also see saw now number 3 consciousness is not many not that there are ma many there are many bodies here and many persons here but the claim in vedanta is that the consciousness is not many it's one consciousness in all all bodies and minds so consciousness is one not many number 4 consciousness is not an object everything else is an object to consciousness but consciousness by itself is not an object and number 5 consciousness is non dual there is nothing other than consciousness these are all huge steps if those who have done philosophy will know at each level we are doing a lot of heavy lifting and there can a lot of arguments can be there when you say consciousness is not brain you're talking about the hard problem of consciousness the irreducibility of consciousness there are few thinkers right now like david uh, chamas bernardo castro donald hoffman um a few others philosophers uh, scientists who might agree with this point of view even the latest theory of consciousness in, uh, this integrated information theory tonini i think they are also talk things about consciousness as a ubiquitous reality not something generated by the brain so anyway that's a that's a big that's the big uh, issue now in consciousness study can consciousness be explained by brain activity this is a close correlation but is correlation causation so that's the debate right now but um, vedanta goes further consciousness is not mind right now in consciousness studies mind and consciousness study together as consciousness study consciousness not mind number 3 consciousness is not many the big claim this is where it differs from sankhya philosophy this is there are many purushas many consciousnesses but vedanta says one consciousness further consciousness is not an object so oh, is subject to something fictional no it's it is not an object in fact in vedanta objects are fictional consciousness is the reality and the last one because objects are fictional not a second reality apart from consciousness therefore consciousness is non dual what good is it i just give you the conclusions no time to work it out if you cash it in if you sell the diamond to the diamond merchant Uh, you will see that this consciousness is immortal you are not born with the birth of the body you do not die before death of the body consciousness not being mind is not subject to frustration unhappiness negativity uh, lack of fulfillment no consciousness is limitless it is there is no second to consciousness therefore the entirety of the universe will be experienced as one with you therefore there is no other to you it is ever fulfilled in that sense you really do not that error 
I am this body and mind, and therefore, like the tenth man is dead, the whole series of errors starts. This whole thing is solved at that problem at that point. So therefore, after with that, you still live as this person in this body and mind. But now you know you are not this body and mind. You are not afraid of anything, nor are you unfulfilled. Therefore, you live as this fearless, ever fulfilled person. Your life is a blessing, and you can really be a blessing to others also. That's called the life of a living free or jivan mukti. Okay, that's a sweeping view of the way of knowledge. Thank you so much. Thank you. Can we do a short Q and A? How do we do this? You pass your mic. You have questions, observations. Let's come back to it. Tell us your name and ask it. But make it brief. My name is Tirunarayanan. I have a question. You talked about three paths. Yes. Um, I've heard of uh, karma marga. How does that relate to these three paths? Three approaches, which are well known. Devotional approach, everybody knows because most religions, theistic religions of the world, have a devotional faith-based approach. Yogic approach, well known. But a karma approach, that was um, what is called karma yoga. Uh, two observations here. Traditionally, if you look at the way of knowledge, Advaita Vedanta, in fact, all the Vedanta schools, whether devotional or the way of knowledge, Advaita Vedanta, they would always give a subservient role to karma. Karma done selflessly, ethical karma done selflessly, purifies the mind and makes you ready. In Advaita Vedanta, it makes you ready for knowledge, this enlightenment. It's a pure and steady mind which can hold on to this inquiry and get that breakthrough. The breakthrough is this. Is exactly like that person who said, oh, I am the 10th. See, there's a difference between that man telling them the 10th person is there. Everybody said, all right, it's there, but how, where? And then the person, when he realized it, I am the 10th. That realization is a direct realization. Oh, you see, I am this limitless awareness. Till now, what did I th think? I'm a body with mind and awareness. Now I think I'm awareness in which a mind and body are appearing and changing. So this breakthrough, it requires a mind to be purified and ready. The devotional schools will say, bhakti schools like Ramanuja and Madhva and others, they will say that um, the way of action, ethical, selfless action, purifies the mind for real love of God. So they always give a subservient role to karma. However, Vivekananda gave a prominent role to karma. Uh, Sister Niverita, who in her introduction to the complete works of Swami Vivekananda, she says, it make, uh, Vivekananda is the teacher of karma, the great teacher of karma action, not as divorced from uh, knowledge or love, jnana or bhakti, but as expressing your knowledge and or love. So karma, it need not be something secondary, but you can express your enlightenment. The way you act in the world before enlightenment and after enlightenment. Uh, karma yoga itself is, uh, a, Vivekananda regarded it as a powerful path to enlightenment. Originally, in the original text, you can find evidence for that. Gita, Krishna says, in ancient times, Janaka and others attained enlightenment. Karmana, by work alone, Karmana Eva, Sansiddhim, perfection they attained. And the commentators quickly scrambled to explain it away. Because Krishna is saying, by, by karma, someone attained enlightenment. Uh, Shankara will say, yeah, eventually, karma will purify you, and then you get in this knowledge, and this knowledge will lead to enlightenment. Or Ramanuja will say, yeah, eventually, karma will purify you, then you attain devotion, devotion will lead you to knowledge. But karma, karma, way of action in this world, can also be a direct, powerful path to enlightenment. Swami Vivekananda said to one of his brother disciples, Swami Turiyananda, he said, brother, in this age, uh, till now people attain enlightenment through devotion, knowledge, spiritual practice, traditional spiritual practices. But also in this age, there will be, he mentioned specifically, young men and women will come who will work out their liberation through action, karma yoga. You have somebody here who wanted to ask a question? Yes. Let's tell us your name and ask a question. Hello. Yes. Hey, uh, my name is William. Thank you for the talk. It was great. Um, the question that I have is, um, 
if we are all Brahmin, the the vastness, um, and if brought, does that mean Brahmin sees us? And my second question is, if that's true, then doesn't that mean we aren't the same thing? Does Brahman see us and we aren't the same thing? Yeah. Right. 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 So, what he's asking is uh, an important insight because when when I argued that the seer and the seen are different, right? So I am experiencing something, then I'm different from it. I'm seeing this, so I am not this. I am different from it. And if I apply the same thing to the body, I am not the body. I'm different from it. I'm not even the mind. I'm different from it. Now, this Brahman or Atman or pure consciousness, his question is, does it see us? Does it experience us? Or if I am that, am I experiencing myself? If I am experiencing myself, then I must be different from myself. Or Atman must be different. Brahman must be different from me. Seer and the seen are different, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And if Brahman is seeing us, then I must be different from Brahman. The question, if you understand the question, the answer will be very, very profound and interesting. Good question. And the answer is, yes, Brahman experiences us. So we are different from Brahman? No. <laughs> yes. So here is this question. Um, one might say, how is it non-duality? If you are saying the seer is different from the seen, then there is always duality. You might isolate yourself as pure consciousness by seer and seen method. But then that which is the scene, the world, the body, the mind, that also remains separate from you. How will you become this non-dual reality? How, how is non-duality real? Right. So this method of the seer and the scene, the three arguments I gave, changer and changing and unchanging, seer and the scene, conscious and not conscious, these ones, all of them are called viveka, discrimination or dis um, discernment, separation. Why are we doing that? We are doing that to isolate what is pure consciousness of Brahman or Atman. Having done that, here's the answer to your question. Having done that, we must ask one more question now. It is true that the seer is separate from the seen. That is true. We'll hold on to that. But now I'm asking the question, is the seen separate from the seer? Subject is separate from the object. But is the object separate from the subject? So what kind of question is that? Let me illustrate. If I say the cloth is separate from the microphone. Then clearly the microphone is also separate from the cloth. The two are separate from each other. A is separate from B, B is separate from uh, A. However, let me show you this. The table and wood. Wood is separate from the table in the sense it was wood before it became a table. And it's a table now. And one day it will be broken, it still be pieces of wood. Wood continues. In that sense, wood is not necessarily a table. But this table is necessarily wood. You would say wood is separate from the table and you want us to understand what wood is. But right now you'll have to say the table is nothing other than the wood. When you touch it, you say touch wood. You don't say touch table. Every bit of it is the wood. A better example is our dreams. The mind, the entire dream world and whatever happens in the dream is imagined and projected by the mind. Now, the mind, you the dreamer, you are separate from your dream world. You existed before the dream, you exist during the dream, you'll be existing after the dream. But the dream and the persons in the dream and the events in the dream are nothing separate from you because you are appearing in those forms. Now, the answer to your question is, once you have done the seer and the seen, changing, unchanging, conscious, not conscious, and got a grasp on yourself as the non-objective consciousness, you must move on to that final negation, non-dual. We must ask, what is it now I am pure consciousness. All right. I experience. What do I experience? All of these objects. I experience the mind and thoughts and feelings. I experience the body. I experience the world. But the question is, what are the objects? What are they in relation to me? Are they a separate, independent reality interacting with me? That's dualism. That's the Sankhya philosophy. But Advaita says, whatever appears to you is nothing but you. You, that pure consciousness, you are appearing to yourself as your own object. And there are a lot of arguments to prove this. Is, this is, as I said, this is the last of the five negations, non-dual. There's a lot of philosophy going on there. In ancient arguments uh, between Advaita and the dualistic schools, uh, who, the dualistic schools insist, yes, consciousness is there, and there is a material order, and they interact. 
just like Descartian dualism, Advaita also will attack at that point of interaction. How do they interact if they are entirely different? If they're entirely different, they cannot interact. Yet they appear to interact. Right now they're interacting. I am consciousness. Here is a mind. Here is a body. They seem to be interacting. In that case, they cannot be radically different. One must be in some sense reducible to the other. See, this is what science does. This is what materialism does. This consciousness cannot be radically different from the body. It must be produced by the body. And therefore, they try to reduce consciousness to the brain, to matter. Whereas Advaita does the exact opposite. It reduces uh, matter to consciousness. It says matter is an appearance in consciousness. I'll direct your attention to a very interesting uh, article, half humorous article by Galen Strawson, who was a professor of philosophy at UT Austin. He wrote this article called The Hard Problem of Matter in New York Times. Hard problem of matter. He says, there is really no hard problem of consciousness. We have made up our minds that brain is producing consciousness, and then we can't explain how brain is producing consciousness, and therefore, hard problem of consciousness. But he says, take a look at it from your own experience. We are all conscious. And matter, including brain, it comes to us in consciousness. So consciousness is not in doubt every, anywhere. What is the question is, what is matter? And he says, physics explains or explores what is matter. And Garen Strawson says, matter is disappearing before our very eyes. And it's gone down to particles, subatomic, subnuclear, now super strings, who knows what. Materialism tries to reduce consciousness to matter. Advaita Vedanta does the opposite. It says, matter is an appearance in consciousness. In fact, let me give you, zoom out, give you the big picture. Uh, just tantalizing. I will not explain this, no term. This is a whole course in philosophy, Indian philosophy. What's Indian philosophy's view on this question? Consciousness and matter. Four, five views. One is the materialistic view. Consciousness is produced by matter. The ancient Indian materialist Charvakas, like our modern materialists, used to say that. Consciousness is produced by matter. This is an example which Indians will love. Pan. Pan. If you chew pan, in pan there is nothing, nothing red. But if you chew it, the charvakas say, red color, your tongue becomes red color. It's a mixture of the elements in the pan which produces that red color in the pan. Similarly, a very sophisticated argument. It's a mixture and interaction of elements in the body which produces consciousness. Not Our modern materialists have not gone one step beyond that, in principle. That is the charvaka, materialist. The opposite view is consciousness is produced, uh, matter is produced by consciousness. Who says that? Every theist religion says that. You know, God creates this universe. So God must be a conscious God, not an unconscious God. So God creates the material universe. Then the third approach is dualism. Neither produces the other. Consciousness and matter are parallel realities interacting with each other. The ancient Sankhyans, Kapila, they said this. And they held on to a matter consciousness duality. And so do their modern panpsychists. David Chalmers and others are proposing reviving panpsychism that consciousness might be a ubiquitous reality in this universe, interacting with the material universe. Then there is the, as a sample, there are many theories. I'm just taking one theory from a very sophisticated and diverse Buddhist theory of consciousness the um, emptiness theory. Neither consciousness produced matter, nor matter produced consciousness, nor are they parallel realities, nor do they interact. Both are empty. They both rise and fall together. Interdependence or the emptiness view. The Chandra Kirti is the example of two bales of straw leaning against each other. You remove one, the other will fall. So they point out, notice, this whole thing about consciousness and object, you know, subject and object, seer and seen, consciousness and matter, they always come up together and disappear together. You have never experience of consciousness by itself. You have never experience of object by itself. You cannot. Literally, it means experience is defined as consciousness plus object. E is equal to C plus O. So they say both are empty terms. They appear and disappear together, whatever you make of that. Shunyavada, Nagarjuna, and Chandrakirtina. And then finally, the fifth view would be um, the Advaitic view, where it says, Matter is an appearance in consciousness. Basically, consciousness is something that gives us first-person experience. To have first-person experience, you need an object. If consciousness is the only reality that there is, 
then every object that appears in consciousness must be somehow consciousness itself. And then they have a whole theory of Maya. Anyway, long answer too. But what is a very good, uh, very good question? My name is Santosh. Uh, I have a question. In spirituality, they talk about the the body and the atma or the soul, right? So uh, everybody say that soul is a part of a body, like it stays somewhere here in fontanel, and um, is conscious generated from the soul? No, um, in the in Advaita, in Sankhya, there are different theories of this, but all of them will say Atman, the self, is consciousness, and it's not a part of the body. Body is also not part of the of consciousness. Body is an appearance in consciousness. There are other theories like the Sankhya, the Vishishta Advaita, Advaita theory, which will they will say no, body is real, and there is a soul which is the subtle body which is separate from the body, but interact with the body, much like software and hardware. And consciousness is something separate from them. That also interacts with them. And all three are real. They are like three interchangeable parts, which, not interchangeable, three parts which interact with each other. That's not an Advaitic uh, idea. Uh, that's a uh, uh, dualistic idea. There are multiple versions of it. Because someone dies, hmm. like they say so what that... what happens at death is that physical body dies, the subtle body, which you can generically call soul, the English word soul, that goes on from one lifetime to another. It's like your data. If you lose your hardware, your laptop crashes, the data is still safe in the cloud. So the body crashes today. You are the subtle body is still safe in the cloud. And then it can be downloaded on the body, the whole idea of multiple births. But Advaita Vedanta says, quite apart from this is your nature as pure consciousness, which watches this entire movie. Which one carries the consciousness yeah. forward? Consciousness not carried forward. But if you say what, what carries the impressions, the samskaras, the individuality, the personality forward from lifetime to lifetime, that's the subtle body. Because they say that the culture, for example, uh, in our past birth, what culture we followed normally right. follows yes. uh, through the soul to the other body. Right. So as I just answered, those are that's transmitted by the subtle body, sukshma shakti. It's like, it's like, say, a pot of water. The pot may be broken, then the, you transfer the water into a new pot. Then the water may contain certain, maybe it's a sugar water or something, that will go into the new pot, You're carrying the same characteristics. But neither is consciousness. Uh, from the, in this example, consciousness would be the one sun shining on all these pots of water. It's an example. Okay. Um, how are we doing? We are out of time. Okay, there's a question there. Yes, the gentleman here, the, the young, you already asked the son. <laughs> gentleman here, and then we'll go to the very end, the young man there. Yes. Pranam Pranam your name and ask the question. Uh, just one question. Uh, basically, when we are going from body to mind to intelligence, and finally in the manam, I mean, Anand Maya Kosha, it turns inwards. What is it that turns inwards? Subtle question. Nothing really. It's just the knowledge that I am not this uh, Ananda Mayakosha. I am not this. Then it becomes clear what is are all these appearances. That is a very subtle point. You have to get it yourself. Shankaracharya explains this with a story in his Aitiri Upanishad Bhashyam commentary. commentary. It's a subtle story. It's worth listening to. He says, a man was very depressed because he had been scolded um, by his guru. His guru told him, you're not a human being. Yelled at him, Amanushyatvam, you're not a human being. He became very depressed. Somebody asked him, why are you moping? Why are you depressed? My guru said, I'm not a human being. Amanush, I'm not a human being. So this man wanted to help him. He said, so you're not a human being. Um, are you a stone? He said, no. Are you a plant? I'm not. Are you a fish? No. Are you an animal? No. So all the non-human, he excluded. So you clearly see none of the Amanusha, non-human you are. None of them. You agree? Yes. Then what are you? This man says, yeah, what am I? At that point, if the man says, what am I? Shankaracharya comments there. Nobody can help him. Because, he, see, set theory. A and not A. 
Yeah. Human and non-human. He said, I am not human. I'm depressed. Now I, you have shown me that all the elements of the non-human, I am not. Therefore, the only thing that remains is the human. I must be human. I must, uh, I must say, oh, I am human. I get it. But at that point, if I don't get it, I say, then what am I? Shankaracharya no, says nobody can help him. Of course, in the example, someone can help him. Someone can say, oh, you are human. But in the case of pure consciousness, you cannot point out that pure consciousness. You have to grasp it yourself. That inward turning one has to do. One Swami pointed out beautifully. He said, look at this aquarium. Have you seen how fish swim in the aquarium? They swim like this on one foot. They'll go to one end and then what do they do? <laughs> that turning around, it's not a physical movement, of course. But it's a radical... Um, one thing one must not do at that point is what the usual tendency. That, that uh, tenth man... Always the tendency was trying to find the tenth man outside. You can never find it outside because it's not there. The great philosopher Hume, David Hume, he says, what is this self that people talk about? When I enter into myself most deeply, I'm quoting him now, when I enter into myself most deeply, I find perceptions, memories, judgments, but I do not find anything corresponding to the self. Why? Because we'll say, David, you are looking in the wrong place. You, the self is the one which is looking. You'll never find it there. One must not objectify at that point. That turning inwards does not mean trying to find something inward. It is just, oh, I being that. I am that to which this darkness is appearing. That even that I am that realization requires the intellect to formulate it. Yeah? Right. That's as close as we can go. Before, without becoming enlightened. <laughs> Pranam Swamiji, my name is Anand. The question you said, uh, if I am Brahman, mm -hmm. then who is ignorant? Uh, big, big question. This, if you think about it seriously, you will come to this question in Vedanta. If you come to this question, it means you are thinking about it seriously. So Shankaracharya answers this question very nicely. Number of times in the commentaries, in Shank Shankara's commentaries, it comes up. One, one way... He does it quite humorously, deftly and humorously. In the, in the 13th chapter, I think, of the Bhagavad Gita, the commentary in the second verse, long commentary is there, somewhere there, I think, if I'm not wrong. The opponent asked, or the student asked the teacher, wait a minute, if I am Brahman, who was ignorant? If Brahman can't be ignorant. Then who has ignorance? Because you started with ignorance. Right? You started with ignorance. This is seven stages of spiritual life. First stage is ignorance. Without this ignorance, none of this works. So who has ignorance? And Brahman can't have ignorance. Shankara's answer to that is very interesting. He says, why are you asking? This person says, I'm, because I don't know. Ah, so you have ignorance. But I am Brahman. If you know that, there's no problem. <laughs> so, this is the thing. Right now, when we are told all this, our first reaction is, oh, is this so? But I don't know it. So I'm admitting at all, if Vedanta is true, then I'm quite ignorant of this truth about myself. Then inquire. Then you will find it. When you find it, the interesting thing that will be is what Vivekananda calls the open secret. You will say, oh my God, it was always there. I never noticed it. And this is such a great, great thing. That's why the story of the washerman's diamond is so important. It will be exactly like that. It was always there. I'm, I'm, it's not even hidden. It's not even hidden. Shankaracharya says in Aparokshanabhuti, beautiful verse, like a clay pot. It's like this wooden table. Will you say that the, the wood is hidden here? Not at all. It's on the surface. It's on the, mid the middle, at the bottom. It's just wood through and through. But if someone doesn't understand what wood is, it's hidden for that person. If it was completely hidden consciousness, that would be something. But consciousness is not completely hidden. We all admit we are conscious. But we don't give too much importance to it. So who has ignorance? The sentient being. I, the jiva. Who is the sentient being? It's Brahman ultimately, really. But right now it is that pure consciousness associated with mind, intellect, body, senses. And thinking somehow, feeling, I am this mind, intellect, body, senses. Yeah, but consciousness, if you, if you insist. But... It is consciousness experiencing mind, body, intellect. That feeling is not there for us. That shift, paradigm shift is what Vedanta 
it tries to induce that is called enlightenment in this way of knowledge you see it's quite different from devotional exercises it's quite different from even meditative exercise this is the distinction i want to draw it's not usually appreciated last question sorry tell us your name and ask question my name is mohan <clears throat> so you talked about consciousness being all there is and it kind of reminded me of the view of philosophy which is solipsism yes it's basically the idea that my consciousness is all there is no one yes this is all that there is is there a conflict with that and what you're talking about it, and it, it feels like there is because you constantly refer to all consciousness where right? i don't think you think you're the only conscious person but if there is a conflict with solipsism how can we deny con- the possibility of consciousness in like ai because what you you said earlier ai is essentially algorithms mm-hmm. but i think a neuroscientist might argue that our brain is just a big computer with algorithms in it yes so how can we deny ai consciousness and is is there a conflict between this and solipsism okay good question so solipsism is the idea i'll i'll distinguish solipsism from the advaitic view when you study advaita quite at some point you will quickly get the feeling you're talking about some kind of grand solipsism solipsism is the idea and it's a fault in philosophy that uh, um i am the only one who exists you all are my dreams i'm sorry but i only exist you don't you're all my dreams <laughs> uh it's like uh living in a simulation where you're the only person who's who is real and everybody else part of the computer uh computer is simulating all of them it's like that um and that's a fault in philosophy some philosophy is driven to that so why is advaita different from solipsism it seems to say there is only one consciousness and i am that one consciousness because first of all it says i not in the sense of one individual notice it first deconstructs the individual not the body not the mind by the time you this you become the witness of the body mind you're no longer a particular person it's an impersonal consciousness and then you go further to say it's the same consciousness in all beings so we are actually talking about all living beings being illumined by one consciousness we're talking about the oneness of all living beings we're not talking about everybody being in the dream of one living being solipsism is classically defined as one mind is real and everything else is an uh, experience in that mind it's a, like a purely subjective perspective uh, but this is not that it says all subjects are illumined by one consciousness and this consciousness is not a particular mind it's a witness of all minds in fact vedanta admits freely there are many bodies and many minds and many persons many points of view but all of them are illumined by one consciousness so that's quite different from the usual solipsistic view now uh if i understood the second ai question if you say the two aspects to it one is um a neuroscientist might say ai is uh, uh, algorithms and you say it can't be conscious but our brains and run by neural networks are also algorithms in a certain sense so well, we are conscious why can't ai be conscious vedanta would say that we differ because we don't think that the brain generates consciousness but the brain can work through these and the consciousness can work through these brains and it does clearly consciousness works through these brains um uh, our brains are brain activities closely correlated with our conscious experiences that's beyond any doubt you can push the question a little further if the consciousness let it be one non dual consciousness but clearly it works through these brains so why can't it work through artificial brains and um, you know um, ai uh, neural networks and vedanta would say there it can it can in that sense because ultimately vedanta would say underlying the robot and the human machine and the artificial machine artificial brain and this biological brain underlying all of that is one universal consciousness if it can express through one body and mind why can't it express for other what we are denying is that this consciousness is produced somehow by objective processes i'll show you the the difference in this what I, i'm trying to say is that this consciousness is not an object algorithms are objects artificial brains and biological brains are objects objects is not producing another object that is not consciousness uh, we are we are not talking about that, that we are saying that's not possible um i had this argument with or discussion with a professor of philosophy at cuny um massimo 
he is a biologist and a professor of philosophy also. So he says, look, I am quite convinced and I can't prove it, but I'm convinced that consciousness is a product of living brains. So even artificial brains can't be conscious, living brain. Um, and, but I can't prove it. But give us time, 40, 50 years, we will prove it. It's called promissory materialism. Give us time, we'll prove it in, in time. And his argument is, look, life, we used to think that life cannot be explained. I mean, life is something divine, only God, you know, and scientists cannot explain life. But now we can explain what you consider to be life down to its very molecular processes. And there's a good enough explanation. And I'm sure in 40, 50 years, we will do the same thing for consciousness. We'll be able to explain consciousness in terms of brain activity. And I said, no, I differ. Why? Here's the difference from an Advaitic perspective. When you explain life in terms of molecular processes, Advaita has no problem with it because life is objective. A high level objective process is explained in terms of fundamental objective processes. That's basically science. Science does that all the time. But we are claiming that consciousness is not an object. And if you want to explain what is not an object, what is pure subject in terms of objective brain processes in philosophy, that's called a category error. You're making a big jump. Consciousness, according to Vedanta, is not an objective thing. It's not like life or the physical world. This is an argument. Good. On, this, uh, on that note, let's bring the proceedings to a close. We do a peace chant.